Ephesians chapter 1. Tonight is our second lesson of our Metro Bible Institute on rightly dividing. And of course, the most simple division of rightly dividing in the Bible would probably have to do with law and grace. And we started on last Sunday night talking about law and grace. In fact, in our previous lesson last week, we looked at seven reasons why the law was given. Uh, first of all, the law was given. God gave the law to serve men, to protect them, to preserve them, and to bless them so that all, so that all men would be drawn to the lawgiver. The second reason the law was given, was given to the nation of Israel, was so that they could dwell peacefully with one another in the land of promise. The third reason that the law was given was to protect the people who could not keep the law from other people who could not keep the law. The fourth reason for the law was to prove to man his guilt and need for grace. The fifth reason for the law was to reveal the glory and the holiness of God. The sixth reason for giving the law was to prepare men for Christ. And the seventh and the final reason we looked at last week the law was given was to illustrate in picture form the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so that's why the law was given. We're going to look at tonight, I think there's six, we're going to look at six pictures of the law. And uh, then, depending on how far we get, we're going to look at some things concerning Jesus and the law. And so... The New Testament uses uh, picture language to describe the law, and it is compared to six things the law is in the New Testament. We'll take a quick look at those in these New Testament epistles. So let's pray together, and we'll start right here in the book of James. Heavenly Father, we sure do thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. We thank you for folks who have made their way out on a very cold, rainy, dreary Sunday afternoon to be with us in the Lord's house. We're so thankful that they're here. I thank you for the good fellowship, the good singing, the time of prayer together, always a blessing. Appreciate Brother Fred, his son Nicholas coming by, being with us in the service tonight. And I pray that you would help us now as we've come to the preaching part of the service. I certainly do pray that you would use us to be a blessing and a help to God's people. And Lord, we'll sure thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, James chapter number 1, the first picture of the law that we'll look at is in James chapter 1, and it is a mirror. Look what the Bible says, James chapter 1, verse 23, says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we see here in this passage of scripture when a man takes an honest look into the law, the law shows him what he is. Oftentimes, the reason that many folks don't like to read the Bible or grow weary with reading the Bible is because the Bible is a reflection of what we are. The Bible is a mirror, and the thing about a mirror is a mirror doesn't lie to you. You may can ask someone, do I have something on my face, and maybe they are being facetious and want you to walk around like that all day. And they say, no, everything looks great, or, or is my hair okay? And it can be a mess, and they sure, it looks fine. But when you look in a mirror, you get an identical reflection of what you're looking at. When we look into the perfect law, the liberty, or the law of God, the mirror, uh, the perfect law of liberty, the Bible calls it here, it doesn't sugarcoat things. It shows us exactly what we are. And so the reason that unrighteous people don't read the Bible is because it reflects who they are. The reason that carnal Christians or carnal people want a church where there's no Bible preaching and no Bible teaching is because they do not want to be exposed for what they are. The Word of God shows us exactly what we are. So it's a mirror. Now come to Acts chapter 15. The second thing, a second thing, a second picture in the Bible 
that we'll see concerning the law. The law is likened to a yoke. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, seems like we made mention of Acts chapter 15 in our Sunday school class this morning. But Acts chapter 15, they're having this, this huge council in, in Jerusalem concerning uh, the Gentiles that were saved, and they were saved by grace. They were not saved by keeping the law. And so there's a mention here in verse number 10 of Acts chapter 15 about a yoke. And so we see here that the yoke is compared to a law or to the law. A yoke is something that brings bondage. Look at verse number 10, verse number 10, Acts 15. The Bible says, Now therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And so you have a farmer, you have uh, someone who is interested in raising crops back in these days. They didn't have tractors and all the modern machinery that we have nowadays. And so they would have this yoke. And, and instead of one oxen going one way and one oxen going another way, they would put a yoke upon the necks of these oxen and they would be forced to go the same way. They would be forced to go in the same direction. So the law here is compared to a yoke. There's no way that the law could set a man free from his sinful nature. However, it could bind him by governmental authority or by the fear of God to go in the right direction even if he had no desire to go in the right direction. Now, I'll give you an example of that. You see on one side of that yoke, you see a policeman or maybe a, um, a judge or a warden or I like to even think of it about a parent on one side. And on the other side, you have an individual who, who, who wants to steal, he wants to cheat, he wants to lie, but they are afraid of the consequences of the law, and so that yoke forces them to walk in agreement with the law, even though they have no desire to walk in agreement with the law. It is a yoke of bondage. I can only imagine, I thought about this this evening, I was reading over all of my notes again this afternoon before we came to church, and I, I put this little note in there. I can only imagine, I, well, I don't even want to imagine what kind of mischief I would have gotten involved in as a child if I were not afraid of the consequences that I would have received from my parents as well as from the law. Mom and dad, it's not that way today, but it uh, doesn't seem like it is. But in the generation I was raised up in, you were taught to respect the law. You were taught that they were the authority, and you had respect for those that were in authority. And I had parents who made sure I didn't. Now, it didn't take the desire. The law doesn't either. We'll talk about that in a minute. The, the, law, didn't, the, the law didn't take the desire out of my heart to want to commit mischief and want to do wrong, but it kept me from doing it because I was afraid of the consequences should I get caught disobeying the rules. Now, this law is the same way. You can take a yoke, if you, you can take a, um, you can yoke up the two. You cannot take the stealing out of the man's heart. You can't take the lying out of a man's heart. You can't take the disobedience out of a child's heart. But that law will certainly keep him from acting on his desire. You understand what I'm saying? And so Galatians 5, Galatians chapter 5, turn there if you will. Galatians chapter 5, look at the Bible says. Galatians chapter 5, somebody just turned the lights on, Amen. Galatians chapter 5, they want me to look good on TV. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1, it's going to take more than lighting to make me look good on TV, amen. I think it's a good makeup artist or something in here. Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says this in verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You see, that's the law. It is a, it is a yoke of bondage. Now, one can never get eternal life through the law, but one can certainly govern morality by the law. That is for sure. Now, so the law is a mirror. The law is a yoke. Come to Galatians chapter 4. You're right there in chapter 5. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Not only is the law a mirror, the law, a, a picture of the law of a yoke, it is also a tutor or a teacher. Look at Galatians 4. Verse number 1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from the servant, though he be lord of all. So you may have future rights to the whole family enterprise, 
But as long as you're still a child, you're going to get up, you're going to go to school, you're going to learn your lessons, you're going to work, you're going to work just like you are a servant, even though you are an heir. Now, look at verse number two. I'll read them together. It says, but, I, but now, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So we see the law is a tutorer. And again, the idea of the teaching or the instruction is a restraint and instruction. So the purpose of the law is to teach man what is right and by that, thereby hindering them from doing what is wrong. So the law is a picture or the, a teacher or a tutor is a picture of the law. Now come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, picture of the law, we'll see that uh, the law is a letter written on stone. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 6. <clears throat> the Bible says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now notice verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written in, and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, obviously, we read this, we cannot help but think of Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the law, the commandments from God, and these stones, obviously, that Moses had received, they contained the words of God, and yet the stones themselves were lifeless. You see what the Bible says in verse number 7? They were the ministration of death. So, an unsaved man, he can read the law, he can study the law, he can even attempt to obey the law, but the law has no ability to give life. You, you, it is, without being born again, it is impossible to have spiritual life. Now, these are called, we talk about, the Bible says here, but of the ministration, if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones. You can punish someone with a stone. You can, you can beat them over the head with it. You can punish someone with the law. You can beat them over the head with the law, but, they, but it'll never bring about life. It is a ministration of death. You can, you can use a, phone, uh, uh, a stone to, for a foundation on which to build. You can hide behind a stone. You, uh, you can do a lot of things with a stone, but you cannot. what you cannot do with a stone is produce life. The law will never produce life. Life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. So the law is a mirror. It's a yoke. It's a tutor or a teacher. It's a letter written on stone. The law is a veil. Look at verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So men of old, they could read the Old Testament, and they saw God's laws, but they did not see Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of times we are critical. We wonder how those men they, that, that had the Old Testament, and they read that, and, and even in the, in the Gospels, those Pharisees and Sadducees and all of that, and we wonder how in the world they didn't see Jesus. There was a veil over them. They were, they were blind. You and I, you and I on this side of the cross, we can see lots of those pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. But they, they were not able to see him. They saw the shadow, but not the one casting the shadow. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he did everything that he possibly could to remove that veil from them. He, he did all kind of miracles. He gave sight to the blind. He, he calmed the raging sea. He raised the dead. He done all kinds of things to reveal unto them that he was the God-man, that he was the Christ. He even stopped the funeral procession and raised the widow woman's son, and yet they failed to see or to realize or to understand that he was the Christ, the son of of the living God. So that law is a veil. Now look at this in Romans chapter 7. I, I, I like this. In Romans chapter 7, I like what Brother James said in his book. He said that a man got up to, one preacher introduced Romans 7, 1 through 3 with these words, did you hear about the wife who married her second husband on the same day her first husband died? Well, I, I guarantee you that got somebody's attention. And so he, what he's writing about here in this, in this, in Romans chapter seven, that has to do with marriage. What the the what the Bible is trying to get us to see here is not necessarily the physical marriage relationship, but the fact the moment that we are dead to the law and we are born again in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have died to the one and received the other. And so we see here in this this the law is likened to a deceased husband. Look what the Bible says in verse number 1, Romans 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. So Paul here, he's writing this epistle to, the, to those in Rome, and he is writing it with the idea, of course he's writing on the inspiration of the Spirit of God, but also the idea and the understanding that they have some knowledge of the law. And so he says here, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, if you notice here in this passage of Scripture, there is nothing in the passage of Scripture about an interval between the time of the death of the husband and the wife's remarriage. Now, I understand that it would be a little awkward in the physical realm. For one, for one I mean, I, I don't know. I just think it would be look bad on my wife if she were to marry another man the day that I married, <laughs> the day that I died. Let me get that right. I think it would look a little, it would, it would look a little bit suspicious, like maybe she was already looking for one, or maybe she poisoned me to get me out of the way. I don't know. But uh, anyway, the, the idea here, so there's not an interval mentioned here in this passage of Scripture about the, the amount of time that should take place from the death of the husband to the remarriage of the wife. And so the, the, the idea is used to explain to us the relationship of the believer to the law of God and the saving grace of God. So the very moment that one is born again, the very moment that one puts their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, all relationship to the law of Moses has ended. It is dead. It may be fondly remembered, but it is over. Amen. Look at verse number 4. We're in the same passage. Look at verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. Who is that? Even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. So the point is not merely, the point here is not merely that the old relationship has ended and that the new relationship has begun, what we're getting here is the fact that the two relationships cannot coexist. You can either be under the law or you can be in Christ, but you cannot be both. Amen. And so uh, you become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. So that is six pictures of the law. Now, just briefly, while we're in Romans, come to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're already in Romans chapter 7. We're going to drop down to verse number 12. Is something wrong with the law? Here's point number three. Point number one, why was the law given? 
pictures of the law. Number three is something wrong with the law. Now, this far in our study, we have seen that it is clear that the law cannot save a man and the law has no ability to make a man righteous. Uh, in fact, the law leaves a man coming short of God's glory. But is there anything wrong with the law or, is, uh, uh, does, the, uh, or does the failure lie elsewhere? I promise you the failure lies elsewhere. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So it is extremely evident that there is nothing wrong with the decrees of the law whatsoever that God has issued. Now, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we won't turn there, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And so man's inability to obey the law or obey the word of the Lord does not mean that God's word is flawed. We see clearly from this verse in 1 Timothy 1.8, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. We see from this verse there is a lawful use for the law. And we've already seen in our study this far that the good use of the law is the restraining of an unrighteous man and the bringing of honest men to Christ. The improper use of the law is trying to get to heaven or try to, trying to earn eternal life by the keeping of the law. That is impossible for us to do. You'll never be saved by keeping the commandments. You must be born again. Now, come to 1 Timothy. I mentioned 1 Timothy just a moment ago, 1 verse 8. Come to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Here's the, first, the fourth point. We went on that third point, but just a moment. Here's the fourth point, and this is where we will be the remainder of the evening, and that is Jesus and the law. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, and also hold your place when you find it, and go ahead and find Galatians chapter 4. We'll read 1 Timothy first, but we will look at Galatians 4 and verse number 4 as well. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to consider the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the law that God gave through Moses. First of all, we know that Lord Jesus Christ was made under the law. Look at verse number 16, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. The Bible says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What are you talking about? There's no controversy about the fact that it is a great mystery that God was manifest in the flesh. I don't, I, don't think we fully, I don't think we fully grasp, or we certainly don't, uh, oftentimes, I'm not saying it's always that way, but there certainly are many times that we do not revel in the fact that God himself was manifest in the flesh for mankind. What a great blessing that is. Now, according to Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3, we know that he was born in the lineage of Abraham and David. As touching his humanity, Romans chapter 1 teaches that he was a Jew, but uh, Romans chapter 4, or Galatians chapter 4 that we made mention of, uh, we understand that he was subject to the law. Verse number 4 of Galatians 4 says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the, uh, under the law. So here's what we know. Though he was the author of the law and the mediator of the covenant, he humbled himself and became man. Having become man, he was no hypocrite, nor was he an abuser of his power at all whatsoever. He made him subject to the very decrees that he had given Moses to write on Mount Sinai in the commandments. So he was made under the law. He placed himself under the same decrees that he placed the nation of Israel with the law. Now, not only was he made under the law, number two, he kept the law. What a blessing. He was able to do what we, or he could do, what you and I are not able to do. Not only was he subject to the law, he became the first man to keep the law. He kept every jot, every tittle of the law, every moment of every hour of every day for his entire life. He kept the law. You and I would be lucky to do that for any period of time at all whatsoever. He'd done it the entire time. Now, in the Gospel of John, come to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 
talking about the fact that Jesus kept the law. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said this to those who knew and taught the law. Look at verse number 46, John chapter 8, verse 46. He said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? What a great testimony. Uh, Jesus Christ asked this group of folks here. He says, which of you convinceth me of sin? In other words, I, just paraphrasing here, I get the idea that he is saying, can you or have any of you ever convinced me to sin? And yet you are not, you have no desire to believe what I'm saying. I'm saying the truth. Why don't you believe me? You've never been able to convince me of sin. Wouldn't it be a blessing if no one could ever convince us to sin? You say, preacher, I, 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 no one's ever convinced. They don't even have to try. They can get, they, man, how many times have somebody said something about somebody and instead of you biting your tongue, the first thing you find yourself doing is saying something as well. They've convinced you to sin. You had, you had no intention to, you had no desire to whatsoever, but just like that, before you know it, something is coming out of your mouth that you should have kept closed, you should have kept behind the bars of them teeth. And, but Christ, that was not the case with him. He cannot, be, he cannot be coaxed or convinced to sin whatsoever. What a great example for you and I to follow. Now, uh, look, look at verse 29. I, I like this same chapter, John chapter 8, verse number 29. You and I, we, uh, we might try to convince someone of our goodness. We might try to encourage someone to vouch for us, to say that we're good. And this is a good thing. This is not a bad thing at all. You may be putting in a job application and you need, you need a good reference, and you, you, might, you might talk somebody into, you, you know, you're the laziest bum there's ever been and, and never kept a job more than two weeks in your life, but you get one of your friends to feel sorry for you, and they give you a good reference so you can get a good job and, and all of that kind of stuff. That, you know who the Lord had to vouch for him? His father. Look what the Bible says in verse 29. He called his father to witness his sinless perfection. Look what the Bible says. Verse 29, And he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone. Now look at this. For I do always those things that please him. Ain't it a blessing? He is perfect in holiness, perfect in obedience, perfect in righteousness. And he could call his father to speak on his behalf. Look at Matthew chapter 17. You know the story, Matthew chapter 17, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, they had the privilege of traveling with the Lord Jesus Christ to the top of this mountain. And uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was going to transfigure himself before them. In other words, he was, he's clothed in humanity. He's going to reveal to them his glory. I, I like to use this phrase. He's going to give them a glimpse of glory. And uh, he calls Moses and Elijah, and all of that's a great story in itself. Uh, Moses, uh, God had killed him, buried him. They couldn't find his body, but the Lord knew exactly where he was at. Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind. They couldn't find him. They looked everywhere. But they appeared with the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Transfiguration. God transfigured himself before them. Peter, you know how Peter always was, always zealous. You know, I'll tell you this. I'd rather have somebody a little zealous and a little... Uh, you know, they might get a little bit out of line once in a while because they're so zealous and I had a bunch of dead do-nothing nobodies that ain't got no interest in doing anything. But Peter, he, every once in a while, Peter said a few things that was rash that he shouldn't say. And uh, he got so excited and we give Peter a hard time. But I promise you, if God allowed you and I to have that mountaintop experience with uh, that Peter, James, and John had with Moses and Elijah and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he turns around and reveals his glory to you on that Mount Transfiguration. There's no telling how you'd respond either. Peter got excited. He wanted to build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and for the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what God said about that in verse number 5. The Bible says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice came out, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. 
And so God the Father gave perfect witness to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ kept the law. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And so He was made under the law. He kept the law. Number three, He was a minister of the law. You're in Matthew. Come to chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The religious leaders of that day, they had corrupted the law. They had added their traditions to the law and their decrees to the law. They wanted their decrees to even be superior to the law. Jesus came and restored the law to its proper place of authority over the Jewish nation. Notice what he said in verse number 17, Matthew chapter 5. He said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And so Jesus was telling them there, not only do I have no reason or no desire to destroy the law, I am going to fulfill the law. And so not only was he a minister of the law in keeping the law, he was also a minister of the law by proclaiming the law. Now you don't have to turn there, but Romans 15, 8, the Bible says this, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. So he was made under the law. He kept the law. He was a minister of the law. Come to Hebrews chapter 9. He fulfilled the types and shadows of the law. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 11, the Bible says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So those thousands and thousands, and there's no telling how many thousands, possibly even millions of sacrifices over the years of all those goats and all those calves and all those animals and all those bullocks, all those turtle doves, all of those things, all of that blood that was ever poured over those altars of sacrifice, they pointed to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Verse number 13 says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Look at this, verse 14 how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So the Lord Jesus Christ, he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he got up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He ascended back into heaven, and he entered into the holy, holy holies in heaven. And his blood, and uh, he placed that blood upon the mercy seat. And every sinner that will ever place their faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be cleansed from all sin. Not a few sins, not some sin, but from all of their sins. So all of the lost types pointed to the only sacrifice that could ever take away the sins of mankind. And that sacrifice is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he fulfilled the types and shadows of the law. Number five, he bore the curse of the law. Come back to Galatians again, chapter number three. He bore the curse of the law. Now, we've established the fact that all those who failed to keep the whole law every day of their lives were under condemnation. We love the Lord Jesus Christ because he took that curse for us and paid the penalty in full when he died upon the cross. Look what the Bible says in verse number 13. Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hang on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
So not only are we forgiven, not only are we redeemed, but we are freely given the countless blessings to which we previously were not entitled. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. What a blessing. Number six, we'll move on. He brought us out of those, he bought us out of the, out the, he bought, he brought out those that were under the law and made them sons. Now you're here in Galatians, we'll look at chapter four again in just a moment. Now, having paid the, having fulfilled the law, having paid the penalty for those who did not keep it, and having redeemed those who trust in him, the Lord then made those who were servants under the law, he takes them and he makes them the sons of God. What, what a blessing it is that the Lord Jesus Christ would not just deliver us from sin, not just redeem us from the law, but he would also place us in his family as a child. Thank God for that. Look at verse number one. We were here a moment ago, but look at this again. Galatians 4, look at verse number one. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now, we use this word, we use this term, the servant. It speaks of bondage, it speaks of rigor, it speaks of oppression. Most of the time, if you hear the word servant, someone would immediately think of some sort of servitude or uh, they would think um, that it would be something in which they would long to escape from. And then we see also in this passage of Scripture, it speaks of a child So we talk about, we'll use the term son, if you will. It speaks of love, it speaks of life, it speaks of fellowship, and the closest of ties for which the human heart does long. So verse number three says this, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, if you've ever read the book of Ephesians, ever studied the book of Ephesians at all, you know, in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 4, they tell the tale of the Gentiles who have, we have been slaves, we've been in bondage, we have no God, we have no covenant, we have no promise, we have no Savior, we don't have anything. But I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ came, and in the fullness of time, the Bible says in verse number 4, He was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under a law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So, look, not only do we have eternal life, thank God for that. Not only are we promised a home in heaven, praise the Lord for that. Now, we are not just forgiven for our sins, although I'm extremely grateful that I'm forgiven of our sins. But we have been placed in the family. We have a seat at his table. I am now his child. He is my father. I am his son. What a tremendous blessing and a great relationship that is because the Lord Jesus Christ has brought out those that were under the law and made them a son. Look at verse number 6. We see that. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, and heir of God through Christ. So listen, this does more than just... Uh, give us freedom from rules and regulations and demands and penalties for breaking the law. It is an incredible declaration that we have been made members of the family of God. What a blessing that is. Now, here's another thing. He superseded the law with a new covenant. Come to Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews chapter number 8. This, this is really interesting. I like this doesn't have anything to do with me. He's talking about the nation of Israel, but it's a great truth in the Bible nonetheless. Now, in addition to these truths that we've already made mention of, the Lord has promised that another result of Jesus' death for sins is a new covenant between Jehovah and the seed of Abraham. Look at verse number 6, Hebrews chapter 8. Begin reading in verse number 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Well, that sounds good, don't it? For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, now notice this, the days come, saith the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with who? With who? The house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Verse 10, for this is the commandment that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old, not that which decayeth and waxeth. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now, it is very evident from this passage of Scripture that this covenant is superior to the former one. We see that clearly in the reading of the text. It is also clear that the former agreement may have seen decay and appeared to be ready to vanish, but it's still in existence. It is beyond question. It is very plain several times in the Scripture that this covenant is not between Christ and His church, but it is between the Father and His select nation, Israel. Remember what we learned about the law? It was given to govern the life of Israel in the land of promise. Remember we covered that last week in our first lesson. There were consequences for disobedience and the nation all suffered those penalties because no one of them or not one of them kept the law. In the kingdom age, in the kingdom age, the believing remnant of Israel will have several advantages that their forefathers did not have. They knew not of. He just told us about them in this passage of Scripture. So not only will Jesus be present and ruling on the throne of David at Jerusalem, but the veil of their hearts shall be removed so that they can see Him for who He is and understand the Word of God. The passage that we just read holds a remarkable promise. It pledges something never enjoyed by any man, even those in the New Testament church. God said he would supernaturally write his laws in their minds and put them in their hearts. This will enable an obedience that never before was possible, which will result in the full enjoyment in the blessings set forth in the law. This will be something not experienced in any previous age. What a great blessing. He said this. He said, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God, they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Look, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. What a blessing. He superseded the law with a new covenant. Now, number eight. And that this is the last one. I'll be done. He established a higher law. We talked about this a little bit in our Sunday school class a few weeks ago. How that some, you know, some folks seem to think or they have this mentality or, the, or this idea. Come to Matthew chapter 5 while I'm talking. That um, Christ came and the law, you know, was no longer necessary or he made the law weaker or whatever the case may be. But that's not the case at all. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he established a higher law. We've already seen that Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to, fill the law, but to fulfill the law. Now we will see how the Lord took the letter of the law and expanded the letter of the law that we might have the spirit thereof as well. Having learned that the law of Moses was holy, we read that just a moment ago, and just and good, and that it was only defective in that it counted upon the obedience of fallen man. There are many examples uh, that we could use, but we're going to look at four examples. And there's even more than four examples in Matthew chapter 5, but we're just going to look at four. In Matthew chapter 5, on how Jesus expanded the law. Now, each of these will begin with this phrase, you have heard that it was said by them of old time. Look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. That's speaking of the law. Thou shalt not kill. We know, we know that. 
And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now here's the new. Jesus expanded it. Look what he said. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he expands the law from thou shalt not kill. He expands the law to make it a transgression to be angry with your brother without a cause. He makes it, he expands the law to make it a transgression for you to call him a fool. And so we see the Lord expanded the law. He didn't decrease the law. Look at verse 27. We'll see the same principle again. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments written on stone. We know that. Now, what, look what he says. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So here we have the expansion of the law. Not only is the act of adultery sinful, but even the desire to be involved in the act is sinful. Now, this is one of many places where Jesus shows that men may be restrained by punishment, but in their heart they would like to commit the sin. And so Jesus here in this passage of Scripture, he took the manner beyond the deed to the desire. So he expanded the law to include more than the, than the deed. He expanded the law to include also the desire. He made one guilty not only for the outward action, but also for the inward longing or the inward desire to commit adultery. Look at verse 33. We'll see a third one. We'll see it a third time. Again, again, you have heard that it had been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Here we have the expansion of the law or the new, but I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So here he places a higher restriction upon swearing. It is no longer acceptable to forswear thyself. We are now commanded not to swear at all. Amen. Now look at verse 43. We'll look at the last one. We'll be done. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 43. We'll see the law. Here we have it again. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Well, here's the expansion. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. So Christ says it's not enough just to be free of hate and to refrain from doing wrong to others. Now he says that we must love them and do good to them who transgress the law. It's clear from this passage and many more that the Lord is not doing away with the law. Rather, he has manifested the real truth and intent of the law. I like this, and I'll close with this. Where the love of God governs men's heart, men say, Sure, Lord, tell me what to do. Where the love of God does not govern the heart of men, they say, what do you mean, Lord? I can't do that. One approach says, how far would God have me to go? And the other says, do I have to go that far? It is all a matter of the heart. So God help us to have our heart and our minds in line with the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Father, we thank you for the Bible, and we thank you for the opportunity.